Here's what's coming up on today's show. You have to look at a statement on a 401k and you have to look to see if there is company stock in that plan. Because if you don't, and then you roll that money into an IRA, I think there might be some issues with that client if they realize that you blew in any way opportunity for them, especially if they could have saved a chunk of money in taxes had they pursued in you. This is the Retire Happy Podcast with John Amarino a fiduciary financial advisor at Securus Financial in the San Diego area. And Thomas O'Connell, president of International Financial Advisory Group, Inc. in Parsippany, New Jersey. Together, they'll be keeping retirement happy from coast to coast. Welcome back to another episode of the Retire Happy Podcast. I'm your host on the West Coast, John I. Marino, and I am joined, as always, by my esteemed co-host on the East Coast, Mr. Tom O'Connell. Tommy, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Johnny. I what's shaking and baking out there on the West Coast? Nothing. I uh, hopefully the rainy season is is getting beyond us. Um, so we did a little camping trip uh, over Easter, and now it's spring break. So we had a tournament, and normally I can uh, talk about Jake's accomplishments, but uh, this was this tournament was a learning lesson. He had a uh, <laughs> brutal tournament. So, but I, you know, said, Hey, it happens to everyone. And we got big news. Yeah. I I shared it with you that, uh, he got invited to the perfect game, California, all state tournament. So that'll be this summer. So good things. And how about you? How was, uh, college, the colleges? College visits are interesting. There's not much baking here, but last Friday we did have a little bit of a shaking with our 4.8 earthquake. Uh, welcome to the show. So that was uh, that was interesting. Yeah, no, but we uh, Emma and I did a couple of a uh, couple more college visits, and so it looks like uh, looks like the South Bronx in New York is going to be her uh, college destination. So Fordham University, yeah. but uh, not not totally official. But that's where that's where the 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 easy money is betting that out in Las Vegas these days. Uh, that's what Otani's Otani's got the uh, over on Fordham. He's got the over under on that one. <laughs> <laughs> or I mean, his translator who has access to five million dollars. Uh, anyways, uh, <laughs> well, hey, that's good, Tommy, because uh, you know that's a heck of an accomplishment. You know, Fordham, and uh, you know, she's yeah, it's a, a good school. Yeah, bright, bright future in front of her. So, no speaking of accomplishments, today's podcast is going to be on the accomplishment that a lot of people are now entering retirement and they've done a great job accumulating assets inside their 401ks. And now it's time to live off those assets and perhaps roll those assets into an IRA or, you know, do they have anyways or stock options? So today we are going to talk about mistakes that can happen when we're dealing with retirement funds. And uh, Tommy, why don't you introduce our return expert guest? Yes, yes. Uh, Another returning expert, uh, Andy Ives, who is one of the premier uh, IRA specialists in America. I met Andy a bunch of years ago. He works on the Ed Slot uh, staff. He is one of the, uh, one of three advisors that help the advisor. So anytime guys like myself or you, John, we have as uh, elite members of the Ed Slot organization, anytime we have questions about things we're not sure, or uh, we're hearing something different than what we've been taught, Andy is is one of the guys that we all turn to. And uh, I've I've really utilized Andy over the last couple of years. I would think he's he's pretty much been my primary go-to person anytime I have a question about stuff. So it's a pleasure and honor to have him back on the show. He's just a, a, a well full of knowledge. And so, it, you know, I, I feel privileged and lucky to have him uh, in my corner. And as should our clients, John. I mean, really, these are, you know, we work with a, a lot of higher end people with big IRAs and 401ks that just the simplest mistakes, the simplest missteps can cause literally hundreds of thousands of dollars in unnecessary tax consequences. So having a guy like Andy helping our clients out is a real privilege. So with that, uh, let, let's get Andy on there. 
and our special guest this episode, Andy Ives, an IRA analyst for Ed Slot and Company, LLC. Hey, very kind words. Thank you very much and uh, happy to be back. You know, Andy, as like Tom said, I, I can't say enough about your presentation skills. You you just thought, you know, at the last conference out here in La Jolla that I intended and you know, what, 400 pages of information that you guys cover in, in 12 <laughs> hours. And you you give a lot of that presentation and uh, your, your way to just simplify things for advisors and explain things is really second to none. I, I took a lot away from it. And it's not to take away anything from uh, the, any of the other uh, advisors uh, that, that also taught, but you definitely uh, are a great presenter. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, both parents are teachers and educators, so hopefully some of that trickled down to me and I can, uh, you know, uh, continue with their skills as, as teaching some, some, some dry and complicated material. So thank you for that. Yeah, dry is probably a, a good word, but you know, for guys like geeks like John and I, uh, we love this stuff. So, I mean, I know there's a lot of other advisors in our organization that kind of roll their eyes, but I love going to those meetings. I am, I always, always walk away with golden nuggets. And yeah. so for me, I, I mean, I, I, I love it. I, I love doing it. So I really appreciate everything that you do. Well, I'll tell you what opened my eyes. We had, uh, there was a woman at one of our meetings who wasn't a financial advisor. She had nothing to do uh, in the profession. She was just a, a retirement geek. She cl she claimed herself. Uh, she was like a groupie that just loved retirement stuff and actually paid all the money to go to this event, <laughs> to go through a 400 page manual as her, as her fun hobby on the weekend. <laughs> oh my God. That's way weirder. Th that's way weirder than me. <laughs> <laughs> Each their own. <laughs> Oh, I guess, you know, it's better than playing pickleball, I guess, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so, Andy, a lot of what we're going to talk about today is you, Tommy and Tommy alluded, you talked about the fact that, you know, these conferences, conferences like this, education material like this, Tommy and I really do geek out on it because I'm a big 80 20 person. And really, I, I preach to my clients all the time that the 20% of true value is in the planning that we can bring the, you know, if, if the market's not doing good, the silver lining and being able to perhaps do some Roth conversions or stuff like that in a down market. And it's really the information that conferences like that you and, and Ed and uh, your group put on, but the importance of what we're going to talk about today can be huge. And lately, a lot of our colleagues have been hitting Tommy and I up with questions that we're going to talk about today to get this general information out. It's general to, to Tommy and I, but it's it's really complicated to a lot of people and how they can avoid very costly mistakes. And you know, some of the things I want to talk about, and Tom, I'm going to let you talk about the first one is is the age 55 exemption of, of 401ks and you know, the opportunities or mistakes clients can make. So Tommy, why don't you talk about, uh, have your first questions for Andy on that. Sure. I'm going to, I'm going to pivot over. I think, uh, one of the things that we wanted to talk about a little bit, which again, we get a lot of calls from our fellow advisors for help is NUAs, right? And we did a, a did a program last year on that with Andy. Uh, Andy's really one of the foremost experts in, in NUA net unappreciated, um, but net uh, unrealized, net un appreciation. unrealized appreciation. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I, I think, and one of the things I keep getting a lot of questions about people seem to be confusing those with stock options, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, restricted options or qualified options, those types of things. And, and that's not uh, what in any way is. So a Andy, why don't maybe let's just start from the ground up and and yeah. explain what the explain what NUA is, uh, what the advantages disadvantages are that kind of thing. Okay, yeah, NUA is great. Um, it, it's it's a great opportunity for folks that might have stock in their four hundred one k plan that is highly appreciated. Now, highly appreciated is a, is a subjective term, so it's not there's not a you know a, a one answer fits everybody situation. But if you have something that's quote unquote highly appreciated, 
Um, if you did not pursue NUA, if all you did was just basically take your 401k money and your stock and take it out of the plan, or if you rolled it to an IRA and you, in the future, at some point, took a distribution of, of those shares or sold them and, and took the cash, you would pay ordinary income on all that money and all that appreciation. NUA allows you to pay capital gains on the appreciation. So that is, in a nutshell, what NUA is. It is, it is the spread and taxes from paying ordinary income versus paying long-term capital gains. So that spread, that difference is what uh, is the advantage or the benefit of the NUA tax strategy. And that's huge. now, yeah, it could be, it could be, uh, but like I said, everybody's different. You know, you might have a hundred thousand dollars of appreciation to some people. They might not be able to save that much money in taxes with a hundred thousand dollars. Another person might say, you know what? That makes sense to me to save a couple of grand if I can save a couple of grand. So, like I said, it, it's not a one size fits all. I, I say there's a tipping point with NUA, a tipping point where where it makes sense for a person. And identifying that tipping point is the art of NUA. But if you can identify that tipping point, and if you can properly properly implement the strategy, uh, you can certainly save some folks a chunk of tax money. Yeah, and, and Andy, before we go into some of the mistakes, can we just talk briefly about how to identify because I've had some people not understand and I've even had advisors when I've looked on some blogs about having non-qualified stock options not NUAs but the advisors were talking oh you know it's an NUA it's not can we talk about really knowing whether that stock is inside your 401k or whether it's a stock option yeah, it's got to be in the plan. It's got to be, it has got to be stock held within your 401k. And when I say stock, that also works for stock funds. I know a lot of plans will have a person buy stock funds uh, because they can buy partial shares. And then when the person retires or they leave, they convert those stock funds to actual shares. But it's got to be within the 401k. It can't be some sort of, uh, you know, some special uh, stock option plan or anything. It could be an ESOP. ESOP would work, but it, but it can't be some sort of non-qualified uh, company-owned shares. Right. So the it has to be the, the shares have to be inside your 401k. It can't be in a in a side uh, individual or tr trust account. That's right. That's right. It's got to be within the plan. A qualified account like a 401k or an ESOP uh, will work. But but uh, again, got to be in a qualified account. So one thing you had uh, explained to me, Andy, at one point, I don't remember a few weeks ago, a couple months ago, was that uh, you could also uh, privately held company stock can be in that plan as well. It's not just a publicly traded stock. That's right. Yeah, you can do private company uh, stock. Uh, that that certainly will work. You're not restricted to just like what's listed on the you know the Dow or, or, or NASDAQ or anything like that. It can certainly be a private company. Some flexibility for sure with NUA. As long as it is stock held within the account, within a, with a qualified account, like a 401k, there's a good chance you can work with NUA with the NUA strategy. Yeah, yeah I mean, something like that where you're, pri where you're purchasing some shares as a private company, uh, and then it goes public, right? Because typically you're buying mm -hmm. those shares at very discounted values when you're a privately held corporation. And just imagine what you could do with a Roth conversion on something like that too. I, and I, I, I believe Peter Thiel, something along those lines is how he was able to make uh, such a huge impact on his Roth IRA. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, he had uh, he he bought his company shares at just fractions on the dollar. Uh, didn't do anything wrong. And then that appreciated yep. significantly. So that was in a Roth. So yeah, there's a bunch of different strategies you can do. Uh, certainly buying those shares within a Roth IRA allows you the opportunity for that to have significant growth, all tax-free. If those shares have already been in a qualified account and are pre-tax, uh, if you did a Roth conversion, you'd be paying tax on the whole thing. So uh, NUA might be a better strategy to, instead of paying ordinary income on all those shares, you wouldn't have them in a Roth. But at least you can possibly reduce the tax to long-term capital gains rates versus the ordinary income right. and NUA strategy. Right. All right, Andy. So let's talk about the five NUA mistakes you can't afford. And mistake number one uh, is kind of like how I was at the beginning of the show, trying to get uh, Tommy to talk about age 55. But that's quick draw McGraw, right? Uh, how you guys coined it. And that's uh, really uh, moving the company's stock into the IRA prematurely. Yeah, that's true. If you uh, if you roll company stock, if you've got this highly appreciated company stock in your 401k and you rolled into the into an IRA, you will never be able to use the NUA strategy on that stock. You have eliminated that possibility once it rolls into an IRA. So 
we call it quick draw McGraw because I, I can just picture like a young advisor super eager to get some money under their uh, under their name, under their assets, under management. So they roll this 401k into an IRA and they're very happy this money is now under their purview, but they just could have ab obliterated an NUA opportunity because they were too quick on the draw to get that money into the IRA account. So I tell people all the time, uh, you have to look at a, at a statement on a 401k and you have to look to see if there is company stock in that plan. Because if you don't, and then you roll that money into an IRA, I think there might be some issues with that client if they realize that you blew an NUA opportunity for them, especially if they could have saved a chunk of money in taxes had they pursued NUA. So yeah, be yeah. careful with uh, being too quick on the draw. And and I believe in, in your manual, it states that the IRS stated the, the this election is irrevocable. Therefore, the eligible rollover distribution is not eligible for the exclusion from gross income for net unrealized appreciation on the employer stock. So the election is irrevocable. Yeah, once you roll it over, you can't put it back. So once you hit send, basically, uh, it, that that decision is made. Right. And that, yeah, like you said, Andy, that that would be a tough one to be explaining to a client. Uh, whoops, I. I blew a two hundred thousand dollar tax savings because, you know, I didn't know what I yeah. was doing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, another, and, and, another, and you talk about the difference in tax rates on on capital gains. I mean, twenty four percent, twenty eight percent, or fifteen, or thirty three, or fifteen. Mm -hmm. That's significant. Yep. Yeah, especially if you, you know, again, you're a high earner, and maybe you have a pension, or you you have these huge. Uh, IRAs or 401ks that you're going to be living off of, uh, you know, you got clients who maybe are taking two, $300,000 a year distributions to fund their lifestyles um, from these plans. And like you just said, John, I mean, there's a huge difference between a 15% capital gain tax and a uh, 20, you know, a, a 24 or 32% income tax rate. It's a lot of money. One of the other big mistakes I think people are making is they don't get it done in one calendar year. That's true. That's true. Yeah. To, uh, once you decide to move forward with an NUA transaction, you have to get it done before the end of that calendar year. Uh, if you don't, if you miss the end of the calendar year, then that can disqualify the NUA transaction. So you, the entire account needs to be moved. Your NUA appreciated stock typically gets transferred to an uh, in kind to a, a non qualified, just a regular brokerage account. But everything else in the account is then rolled over to an IRA. So it's a lump sum distribution. You have to empty the 401k. And if you don't complete it in time, that could also uh, be the death knell for the NUA uh, strategy. So, and, and you brought up a good point at the conferences. You you said to start this process early in the year and definitely never start this after Thanksgiving. So let's say we have a person that, because uh, I'm actually looking at a, a potential a client right now that is going to retire at Thanksgiving. That will mm -hmm. be their last day. You know, And, and so in this case, they're going to want to wait until 2025 to do this in January. That would be my recommendation. Uh you can't just do an NUA transaction whenever you want. You have to hit what we call trigger events. One of those trigger events is separation from service. So if that person separates from service in Thanksgiving, they can't do NUA before an NUA transaction transaction beforehand. But once they hit that trigger, now their NUA door is open, essentially. Uh, the light is on. The light is green for them to move forward. They don't have to do it in the same calendar year that they hit one of those triggers. So best bet for that person is if they hit that trigger, just pump the brakes wait until 2025, then you have the entire year to process the transaction and do the lump sum distribution. Uh, and you can uh, rest easy knowing you have plenty of time to get it done. I was going to ask John, uh, just as a follow-up to that, what might be something that somebody might do that might unring that bell in John's instance? So um, John said this person's going to separate from service uh, in Thanksgiving, so that or at Thanksgiving, so that means that they're they fit the trigger. What I like to say is uh, the, their light is on. Like I said, the green light is on. Um, if they were then to what I say call activate that trigger, where that light starts to flash, that means they got to move now and get this transaction done before the end of the year. So if this person separates from service in thanks at Thanksgiving, and then let's say a week or two later they take a couple thousand dollars out of their account to maybe pay for uh, upcoming uh, Christmas gifts or something, uh, that account has been activated, so to speak. So that light is now flashing. Now they would have to get that NUA transaction completed before the end of this year. If they don't,
because they activated that trigger by taking a distribution, that light will go off at the end of the year and they will have lost that separation from service trigger. And that could potentially eliminate the chance for NUA at any time from that account until maybe after they die and they don't and their beneficiaries can't do it, which is another mistake we're going to talk about. But yeah, you have to be very careful with the timing. When you hit your trigger, what your transactions are on that account, uh, and what is the calendar saying to you as far as timing? So Andy, you you had mentioned it a couple of times, and Tommy also mentioned trigger. You mind just telling the listeners what are the triggers for NUA? Yes, for sure. There's only four of them. There is uh, age 59 and a half. These are the easy ones. People get 59 and a half. That's one that people typically can get to. There is separation from service. That's another one that people can typically get to. No problem. They can separate from service. But there's a couple of other ones uh, that are specific to situations like disability. It's only for the self-employed. So I have yet to see a disability trigger because, again, it's only for the self-employed. And I also said separation from service. That is uh, not for the self-employed. I've had someone say uh, they had their own business and they tried to create a fake trigger by separating from service to generate uh, this fake trigger so that they could do an NUA transaction. And then they were going to start a new company or go back to work at their company. Can't do that. So it's not for the self-employed. So reaching 59 and a half, separation from service, disability, only for the self-employed, and then death. So if a person dies with all this highly appreciated company stock in their 401k, NUA is available to their beneficiaries. So that's another reason why Quick draw McGraw or being too quick to roll this money into an inherited IRA without considering NUA could get you behind the eight ball when it comes to the beneficiaries and what their tax situation is. So, and just to confirm for our listeners, and, and this is a question that, you know, Tommy will talk about later. If you're separating from service at age 55 and a half, you meet that trigger. 55. Yeah. So 55. So that, that meets it, not the 59 and a half uh, for the IRA, correct? That's true. You could separate from service at 35, at 45. A separation from service is a trigger. Okay. So uh, let's say someone works, I don't know, uh, at Silicon Valley or something back in the day, and they've got a cost basis of $50,000 in their shares, which has ballooned to now a million dollars. And they leave their company when they're 40 years old. That is a trigger. They could do NUA. If they were to do the NUA transaction on this $50,000 basis, million dollar account, Because they're under 55, they don't qualify for that age 55 exception. They're under 59 and a half. They would have a 10% penalty, but only on the cost basis. So in that situation, I'm a 40-year-old. I do an NUA transaction. I've got a $50,000 cost basis. I am happy to pay a $5,000 penalty if they can save me a significant tax hit on the $950,000 of appreciation. Right. Great point. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what's a, John, what's another common mistake on that list that people are making? So one thing that I've seen some people over the past year, yeah, older retirees that just love their job and now they've got RMDs coming up and and making distributions with that NUA, uh, you know, option in their, in their plan. So Andy, you want to talk a little bit more about RMDs and, and you mentioned the distribution, you know, around Christmas time. But RMDs are distributions, right? Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. So so uh, using your scenario where a person loves their job and they're not planning on separating from service anytime soon, if they hit 59 and a half, that's a trigger. So their NUA light would essentially be on. But then let's say 13, 14 years down the road, now, now they're 74 and now RMDs start to pay out of the account. A taxable distribution like an RMD will activate it. That will make that NUA light flash. And there's no way around it because you've got to take the RMD. So if that RMD kicks out uh, and if that person doesn't pursue NUA, they will have lost that trigger. So it can sneak up on you some of these distributions and activate your NUA trigger light. So let's say um, you do love your job. Your trigger is 59 and a half, but you're going to but you're not going to leave work. Mm -hmm. Can you can you do a partial NUA? In other words, can I? pick up my, 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 uh, my stock piece and move that out and still qualify for the NUA and leaving my, let's say my Vanguard index fund intact in the, in the 401k. You, you cannot, 
Uh, you okay. have to empty the account. So, so I've had people ask that question and, and you can't, so they've got to empty the account. But then the next question is, okay, I'll do a lump sum distribution. I'll take my NUA. I'll roll everything else over to my uh, IRA, but then I want to come back and participate in the plan again in future years. And you cannot, you've got to shut it, basically shut it down. You, you are forfeiting your participation in that plan when you do NUA. Okay. Which is another thing. If you're retired, if you're still working at, at 73 or 75, um, you know, it might just be easier just to, since you're in your at RMD age for, for those, for the example, it might just be easier to keep your money in your 401k until you're going to separate service. W would you agree, Andy? Yeah, there's a bunch of options. So if, so if I'm in that boat, if I'm a 74 year old and I love my job and RMD is going to start kicking out. Um, now my trigger has been activated. My 15 and a half trigger is activated. I have to sit down and do some tax planning to see if NUA is good for me now. I can certainly do do uh, uh, an NUA transaction, but I would have to empty the account and again, forfeit my participation. Does it make sense for me tax-wise and monetarily to do that? Or I could just say, you know what? I'm going to forfeit my 15 and a half trigger. I'm going to continue to work and work and work and work. And then when I do separate from service, I will have another trigger and that let will go back on and then I can pursue NUA at that point. Or if I really love my job and I'm going to work until the day I die, death, as we said, is a trigger and my beneficiaries could take advantage of the NUA strategy. Right. So, Tommy, what is uh, what's another uh, issue that you know about when it comes to NUAs? Selling your stock too quickly. Andy, I'm going to throw it over to you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. You know, people see all this stuff about, oh, I've got a concentrated position. I was told I need to trim back my ownership in this account. Or, uh, you know, they think about the back in the day with Enron or our company just tanks and they're worried about it. So they just bail. They sell everything or they sell a huge portion of their stock for whatever reason. Um, even if it's a good company, like I said, maybe they've got this concentrated position and they're looking to trim back, it might not make the make the, mess, the best sense to do such a thing. Uh, look at any way and see if you can uh, do the NUA transaction, get that money out of the plan into a, a, a non-qualified brokerage account, take advantage of that tax break. And then once it's out of the 401k, then you can start to trim back that position. So that might make sense. Again, selling out too quickly could put you behind the eight ball once again when it comes to NUA. And again, for, for listeners, what's Ed Slot's favorite you know term right now is taxes are on sale, right? And how right. many more months do we have until, you know, we have the sun setting and we have, you know, adjustments in a negative way uh, in the tax code. So it's really important to, to understand that. And and I think you would agree, too, Andy, that you do have to it's a fine balance. You know, Tommy and I have both talked about this a lot. The tax implication to the market risk of being over concentrated in a stock. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so again, that gets back to the art of NUA. Uh, what makes sense for a person? What might make sense for person A might not make sense for person B. And there's some flexibility with NUA as well. You know, John, you mentioned that taxes are on sale, but even though they're on sale, if I've got this massive uh, position in my account and I'm going to do an NUA transaction, let's say my cost basis is 500000 and it's a $2 million position. If I do an NUA transaction, NUA rules state that I have to pay ordinary income on the basis maybe I can't afford the taxes on 500 grand. Uh, you can be uh, creative here and say, maybe I can afford the taxes on 250. So you can take half of that stock, do an NUA transaction with half of it, the 250 plus the appreciation applicable to that stock. The other stock you can roll to an IRA. You will never be able to do NUA on that stock that rolls to an IRA, but at least you can do some tax planning and take advantage of a partial NUA transaction. Everything has to come out of that account. We want the, I want to make sure that the listeners understand that. Andy's not saying that you're you're, on, you're only doing a partial distribution from that 401k account. Everything is coming out. It's just that he's separating some, some of that stock holding. That's right. That's right. The other stock that you don't do an NUA transaction with, that will get rolled over to the IRA with all of your other your vanguards, you know, funds or cash or whatever, like you mentioned before. Correct. Great point, Tom. And lastly, you already mentioned it uh, earlier, but let's let's just dig in a little bit more on the last mistake is not telling beneficiaries about NUA. Yeah, that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you know, people when you inherited a 401k account or when you inherited any any account, I'm sure there's some there's some emotions involved. Uh, people aren't you know they're looking for guidance. 
Uh, but once again, uh, before just moving that money out of the plan into an inherited account, consider NUA because that beneficiary will have uh, access to the NUA strategy. If that stock is highly appreciated, just like the person could have done when they're alive, their beneficiaries could have that stock transferred in kind to a non-qualified brokerage account. And again, pay long-term capital gains on the appreciation as opposed to ordinary income if they were to uh, not pursue the NUA strategy. Again, a huge, a huge possible savings for people. Absolutely. Now, I know some tricky people might be like, well, can I get the step up in basis and <laughs> yeah. then claim NUA? Yeah, no work. No deal there. A lot of people who <laughs> have a lot of things will ask about step up in basis. That's not going to work. They'll say, I want to do the NUA transaction, put it into my uh, non-qualified regular brokerage account. And then within 60 days, I'm going to put it into my IRA as a 60 day rollover. No deal. That will also kill the NUA transaction. So everybody's working for looking for an angle, but it's pretty straightforward. You can't do uh, all these creative things that people want to do. Yep. There's no step up in basis from qualified assets. Let's let's just put that one to bed. Right. Yep. So, Tommy, let's go back to my original topic. <laughs> uh, you're uh, age 55, separation from service. So uh, you've had this come up a, a couple times recently. So why don't you uh, uh, talk about that? Right. So I, I have someone who is actually uh, going to turn 55 at the end of this week, going to be retiring after 30 plus years uh, on the job. And they said to me, they said, well, you know, I need about $20,000 to pay off some credit cards. So, you know, my advice to them simply was, well, turn 55 because there is an age 55 exemption for the early distribution penalty in government plans. In other words, in a 401k plan, it doesn't exist in an IRA. So, uh, so I simply said, look, wait till after your birthday then you can take a distribution from your 401k, call it for the $20,000. You'll have to pay tax on that distribution, but you avoid that 10% early distribution penalty. You can pay off you know, your debt, then you can make your retirement decision. And then you can make, from there, you can make your decision whether or not you want to uh, transfer that 401k money into an IRA. But people just have to be aware there's some uh, some eligibility rules that exist for plans and other ones that exist for IRAs. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's, that's good guidance. Um, the age 55 exception can get overlooked or it can get um, uh, misinterpreted. So you have to separate from service in the year you turn age 55 or later. So we've seen people uh, separate from service in the year they turn 54 or 53, but then try to take a distribution a couple years later from their plan when they're 55. And that doesn't work. That does not qualify for the 10% penalty exception. You have to separate from service in the year you turn 55 or later. So in your situation, uh, that's good advice. If, if, that, if that person's going to separate in the year they turn 55, they will be able to access the plan dollars without a 10% penalty exception. And I know some people like to leave some money behind. Uh, you know, if they're going to roll, they've got a five hundred thousand dollar four hundred one k. Let's say maybe leave fifty thousand or a hundred thousand behind in the plan, so that they can at least have access to to some dollars before they turn fifty nine and a half. Because, like you said, Tommy, that uh, that exception is not available uh, within an IRA. Now, you, you, there's also an ex, an age fifty exemption, but that's for a certain criteria of people, correct? Yeah, public safety employees. So there's like uh, you know police, firemen. Uh, nuclear carriers, uh, 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 all kinds of uh, different public safety people, uh, capital police, things like that. But yeah, that's uh, an age 50 exception uh, or 25 years of service, which is brand new with the Secure 2.0 Act. Nice. Now, speaking of young retirees, because, you know, really 55 is a young age uh, to retire. You have clients now that, uh, you know, perhaps they are looking at how to pay their taxes now and buy out the IRS and do some Roth conversions. But, you know, they're 55, they're 56. They're not at that 59 and a half age. And uh, maybe they still have funds in their 401k and they want to get to an IRA. Andy, what says you? What's the best way to do that? Well, Roth conversions, I'm a big fan of, uh, and they can be done at any age. There's there's no restrictions on age or, or income limits. You can have, you can make a million dollars in a year. You can make no money. You can do a Roth conversion. 
uh, where people get sideways uh, as far as age and Roth conversions is having taxes withheld. So let's say I have a hundred thousand dollar traditional IRA and I want to convert it to a Roth. I can certainly do so. The advisor or the, the computer system you're doing the conversion, I might ask you if you want taxes withheld. And let's say I, I choose 10 percent, I'll end up converting 90,000 and 10,000 will then go to the IRS. That's all fine and good. But if you are under 59 and a half, the 10,000 that goes to the IRS does not get converted. It's essentially an early withdrawal, which means you're going to have a 10 percent penalty on the $10,000 that you sent to the IRS. So when it comes to the age limits with conversions, it's not a function of can you do the conversion or not, because you can. It's a function of do you want the taxes withheld from the IRA on the conversion? And if you're under 59 and a half, do not do that. Have those taxes paid from another source. Right. Well, so, and, and ideally, in, in any conversion, you want to have non-qualified dollars able to pay your tax, but especially if you're under 59 and a half, because only the IRS will penalize you for actually paying a tax in double dip room. Exactly. Yeah, have those dollars available for another source. That way you get the full amount into the Roth IRA. The full amount can grow tax-free for you going forward. Right. That, I was just going to say the same thing, John. Um, you know, you, at the end of the day, this whole thing is a strategy to create tax-free money in the future, right? So you want as much of that money compounding as possible for as long of a period as you can. So having outside money to pay that tax, I, I think is critical in in the decision-making process of whether or not you're going to do that Roth conversion. That, Correct. And, you know, I agree. And a perfect example, maybe you can, uh, you know, use some of that NUA money that you moved over and in future years, use that. Yeah, you can, you can compile, you can, you can combine all these different things. I mean, you have, you have the age 55 exception, which, which uh, dovetails with NUA. And as far as, you know, how old you are when you separate from service. So, so whether or not the penalty applies or not, certainly if you have some dollars that you saved from your taxes on the NUA transaction, maybe you can use that money to pay the taxes on a Roth conversion. So uh, yeah, it's all uh, the tentacles of all these different transactions are, are long. And so, Andy, if I can oh, go ahead, Tommy, what you got? No, go ahead. I, I was going to move on and, and talk about some other, um, some other things that we see people mistakes we see people are making with their uh 401ks and IRAs this year. Well, if you don't mind, can we just just finish up on the Roth IRA and the one other mistake because I've actually had people say hey I want to get money out of this Roth IRA the 5 year rule on the Roth IRA conversions or contributions. Yeah, um, the five-year rule, there's really two five-year rules when it comes to Roth IRA. So I'm not surprised one bit that people get them confused. But when it comes to um, conversions, the five-year uh, clock applicable to conversions, if you are under 59 and a half, so let's say I'm 30 years old and I do a Roth conversion, I cannot touch those converted dollars for five years. Roth dollars follow very strict ordering rules. So contributions come out first, then converted dollars, then earnings. And you can't mix and match. That's the order, definitive order. Uh, you always have access to your contributions in a Roth IRA, tax and penalty free. doesn't matter how old you are. Uh, if you put money in and you're 25 years old and you want to take it out when you're 26, if it's a contribution, yes. And that'll come out first. If you're that 30-year-old that I talked about and you do a conversion, you have to wait five years. After five years, converted dollars become available, tax and penalty free. Again, doesn't matter how old you are, but it has to be five years. If... And this is where people get uh, sideways with the rules. Let's say I am not 30, but let's say I'm 60. I've never had a Roth IRA in my life. And I do this Roth conversion. I have access to those converted dollars because I am over 59 and a half. But the earnings will not be tax-free until I've had a Roth IRA for five years. So you've got that five-year clock, which is applicable to the earnings on that conversion for, for a person that's over 59 and a half. We could do an hour on just the five-year clocks on Roth IRAs. But as far as conversions go, once that five years is up, it doesn't matter how old you are, you can withdraw those converted dollars. You'll deplete your, con your contributions first, and then you'll flow into the converted dollars. So uh, that that leads me to, uh, now I'm going to stay on this topic because maybe we can do an hour. Uh, another thing, again, that we that you talked about in the workshop that we attended was the timing and the aggregation of Roths, right? So if I'm 25 
and I open up a, a Roth IRA for say $500, that's when my clock starts, my, my clock starts ticking. Right. So then, you know, then, you know, 10 years later, I can open up another Roth IRA and put $10,000. Well, I can't put $10,000 in it, but I could put $5,000 in it. Right. But my mm -hmm. five year, my five year clock has already passed me by. Well, so this is the two different clocks that we're talking about. And this is this is where I, I call the first five year clock. I call it the five year forever clock. The five year forever clock is that person in your example that put the $500 in and they started a Roth IRA. They started any Roth IRA. Boom. That clock starts to tick that five year forever clock. And after five years, now they've had any Roth IRA for five years. So that box is checked. A subsequent conversion will have its own separate five-year clock. So we've got the five-year forever, which is when you just want to start a Roth IRA. Did you start a Roth IRA more than five years ago? Yes, I did. All right, you satisfied that five-year forever clock because you've had any Roth IRA for five years. Any subsequent conversion, if I'm under 59 and a half, is going to have its own time-stamped five-year clock that I have to wait to satisfy. Now, uh, why is that important? Let's say uh, I mentioned that 60-year-old that did that Roth conversion. Never had a Roth IRA before in his life. He opens up a Roth uh, uh, with, a, with a conversion, does his conversion. Not only did that start his Roth conversion clock, but that also started his Roth five-year forever clock. He wants to keep that going because let's say uh, six years from now, he's 66 years old, and he's got a bunch of money in his Roth 401k at work. If he never had a Roth IRA and he rolled that money from the 401k into his Roth IRA, Roth plan 401k and Roth IRA clocks are independent of each other. You don't get to use the clock for both of them. So if that money rolls from his Roth plan to his Roth IRA and he never had a, a Roth before, he's got to start all over again, five more years before the earnings are tax-free. But if he had a Roth, if he started that Roth IRA and got his five-year forever clock started, that money would come in and he would be immediately available to get those earnings out tax-free. So getting that Roth five-year forever clock start is important uh, for a number of reasons, but one of them is that 401k rollover. We talk about all this and, and people try to make all of this sound so simple, right? Uh, but how many PBS shows has Ed done? Seven or eight, written seven or eight books, has these conferences three, four times a year. The training that I have to go to as an elite advisor is uh, twice a year, right? That Andy, that you're you're one of the the uh, teachers at. Just this topic of Roth IRAs, we've been going on for about fifteen or twenty minutes now. It is not simple, and this is why people make so many huge mistakes, costing themselves and their families literally tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars. This is why, uh, you know, I'm not trying to pat ourselves on the back, but this is why it's important having advisors that know what they're doing when it comes to this stuff. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And it is super complicated. Uh, and I always joke that people will call and advisors will call, you know, smart, uh, seasoned advisors will call and say, with a simple question, it's a one sentence question. What's the deal? When I roll a Roth 401k to a Roth IRA, it is the easiest question. It's one sentence and it is paragraphs of, ans of an answer because there's so many different variables there. So I'm not surprised that people get sideways with the rules, especially people that aren't in the profession. I don't know. Nobody would know how to, how to time this out or what the clocks are or, or what happens when you do that, when you make those transactions. So yeah, it's important to certainly latch onto someone who knows what they're doing when it comes to these things. Wow. Well, that's a, another mind blowing episode. Huh? <laughs> my head hurts. Again, like I, I looked at the clock. I look at the clock. I'm like, man, we just blew through that time like nobody's business. We didn't even get to a lot of the topics we wanted to. But yeah, I I, I want to just talk about what you said there in the, in the closing, really quick there, Tom, about staying on top of this. And and we've heard Ed and Andy have said it, you know, several times at the at the conferences that is that the tax code is ever evolving. It's changed every year, especially since 2017. You've had two major changes with the SECURE Act and SECURE Act 2.0. And this is really to commend you, Tommy, on, on two areas. Number one, for as seasoned and as old as you are, uh, 
<laughs> you never stop learning. There's a lot of guys that we that I've been to conferences with that, you know, investment conferences that they've said, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm past that point. I'm, you know, I'm on the downside. I'm, I'm just trying to simplify things. And, and they're really missing the boat on the education that you continue to get every year, you know, through, you know, Ed Slot and other organizations. And, and the second point I want to bring up to our audience is a point of, con of congratulations to Tommy for getting your RICP, a phenomenal designation. So yeah, appreciate you know, that. Tommy, Tommy's a, a good friend of mine, but he's also been a mentor, you know, for the last 10 years. And you're definitely someone I look to as inspiration and in, in continuing your education and having such a high level for being so old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm still, even, <laughs> even with my bib and my drooling, I'm still learning, John. <laughs> So, well, folks, that wraps up this episode of the Retire Happy Podcast. And, you know, again, I want to thank uh, Andy for coming on the show again and uh, sharing your knowledge. Thank you so much, Andy. Very, very welcome. Happy to be here. It was a pleasure. Yeah, I think I, I don't think we should be waiting another year and and months to get Andy back on. I mean, I, I think we uh, left about 30 questions on the table. So I, I think we need to be getting Andy back on here uh, relatively soon to start going through some of these other things. If that's yeah. okay with Andy. Yeah, happy to come back anytime. I enjoyed it. Andy, Tommy's just booking you up right here. So, uh, <laughs> all good. Well, folks, we hope you got uh, as much. In, and, and really, this was an, an absolutely important episode. I mean, we always try to put out important episodes, but this is, you know, the IRS expects you to get this right. There, the, There's very few wiggle room. As, as we talked about, you know, in this show, irrevocable decisions. So um, very important show. We hope you took uh, a lot out of it. And thank you once again for tuning in to the Retire Happy Podcast. I'm your host, John Amarillo, signing off. And Tommy, we'll see you later. And Andy, thank you for coming on. Be well, everybody. It's easy to get in touch with John and Thomas. If you're more on the West Coast, give John a call at 858-935-6210. That's 858-935-6210 or go online to gosecurus.com. That's gosecurus.com. If you're more of an East Coaster, then call Thomas, 973-394-0623. That's 973-394-0623 and online at internationalfinancial.com. That's internationalfinancial.com. And you can, of course, always just check the description or the show notes section of today's show for all that contact information. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcasting apps, and we'll see you next time on the Retire Happy Podcast. Investment advisory services offered through Brookstone Capital Management, LLC, BCM, a registered investment advisor. BCM, Securus Financial, and International Financial Advisory Group are independent of each other. Insurance products and services are not offered through BCM, but are offered and sold through individually licensed and appointed agents. The opinions expressed by John Iamarino, Thomas O'Connell, and guests on this show are their own and are based upon information considered reliable, although it should not be relied upon as such. Any statements or opinions are subject to change without notice. Investments involve risk and, unless otherwise stated, are not guaranteed. Past performance cannot be used as an indicator to determine future results. Any strategies mentioned may not be suitable for everyone. Information expressed does not take into account your specific situation or objectives and is not intended as recommendations appropriate for you. Before acting on any information mentioned, please consult with a qualified tax or investment advisor to determine if it is suitable for your specific situation. This program is designed to provide accurate and authoritative information with regard to the subjects covered. Registered investment advisors and investment advisor representatives act as fiduciaries for all of our investment management clients. We have an obligation to act in the best interests of our clients and to make full disclosure of any conflicts of interest, if any exist. Please refer to our firm brochure, the ADV 2A Item 4, for additional information.